Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi everybody, uh, this is Professor Bikas Medi. Good morning everybody. Today I am going to talk about anticoagulant. Now before I start, let us put a question, why anticoagulant? Anticoagulants are required because you wanted to reduce the coagulability of the blood or you think of a thrombus and you want to dissolve the thrombus. Now, as you know that body has a defense mechanism that if there is a bleeding, platelet get activated and it from the thrombus in order to prevent bleeding. Now, the question comes is thrombus in artery, thrombus in venous. Now, if you take the thrombus in artery, platelets it adhere to the vessels, it is white in color and most of the time if you see in case of myocardial infarction or in a stroke or any ischemic condition like we talk about transient ischemic attack or any of the ischemia, you find there is a thrombus formation in arteries. Now, in case of the venous thromboembolism, like you can see that there is a you know stagnated, there is a turbulation take place. Suppose the flow is not maintained, so platelet get activated. Like you can take an example of deep venous thrombosis and basically it is a red in color and you get this kind of deep venous thrombosis particularly in congestive heart failure or in case of a cancer with metastasis or during the surgery also. So, these are two differences, one is arterial thrombus, then venous thrombosis you can distinguish. Now, if you see thrombus, it dissolves from artery or vein and it goes in a circulation, you call it embolus. So, there is a thrombus formation, deep venous thrombosis and you have a condition like pulmonary embolism or this thrombus goes in a as a embolus, it blocks the smaller arteries like coronary artery disease or in a stroke. So, in case of a venous emboli which block the artery like in pulmonary circulation, you call it a thromboembolic phenomena, thrombo thromboembolism. So, this is a typical one that, so you have to manage the underlying disease condition. Now, take it in more detail. <coughs> Hypothetically, you find there is a vascular injury. So, that means if there is a vascular injury, there is a exposure to collagen and PWF, the factories get activated. So, it help in platelet adherence because platelet get activated, it from the CDU pod and there is a activation of platelet. So, ultimately, if you see that there is an increased synthesis of thromboxin, ADP or 5 hydroxytryptamine. So, all together it get activated and there is a coagulation processes begin. If you go into more molecular aspect, like we say that coagulation pathway, we have intrinsic pathway or extrinsic pathway where 10 A is getting activated and hits this 10 A is help in conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. And this thrombin, it help in fibrinogen to fibrin which form the clot. Then you can think of the molecular one that activation of ADP, thromboxane, 5 ht or you go into molecular aspect the receptor one like we talk about GP 1A, GP 2B receptors or GP 2B and 2A receptors and this causes the dysregulation and that is how you get an effect of the coagulation or you can develop a drug and give as maintenance of anticoagulation. Now, as I say that 
if you look at in detail the coagulation pathway, in case of a injury, blood vessel injury, where you can think that 12 is converted to 12A and you look at the intrinsic pathway that 11A is 9A, it is converted with the help of 8A and from this 10A it is converted factor 2 to 2A and ultimately what it does is it causes conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin which is a clot, fibrin clot and this is help with tissue factor 7A or in case of a tissue injury there is a release of factor 7. So, there is a extrinsic pathway taking place with intrinsic. So, ultimately what you the result is that you get a fibrin clot and it from the thrombus and once it goes to circulation you cause embolism or you have a thromboembolic phenomena. So, if you can block this pathway then you can have a therapeutic benefit out of it. Now, see some of the factors which is affected by heparin. If you look back and take the history, you can think that initially to understand some of the scientists they had given a modified dietary to chicken in order to establish the bleeding disorders that how the vitamin K is responsible. Later on the medical student itself it identified that there is a role of heparin and it can be used as an anticoagulant. Now the factor hep affected heparin you can see is 9A, 10A, 11A, 12A. Now another thing side if you see the factor affecting the oral anticoagulant which is we use vitamin K dependent factors that is factor 2, factor 7, factor 9 and factor 10. So, you remember the factor affected by the heparin it is basically 9A, 10A, 11A or 12A. Similarly, factor affecting when you give oral anticoagulant like vitamin K dependent factors that is 2, 8, 9 and 10. Now, let us understand that what is a natural anticoagulant system as we say that body has a protective power of anticoagulation. Now, suppose if you have any wound so the factor get like 7A is get activated like you have a factor of antithrombin 3 and heparin protein C or protein S and there is also role of tissue factors pathway inhibitors. So, this 7A is converted to, to 10A with the factor help factor 5A which is ultimately converted to thrombin and from thrombin it is converted to fibrin that is fibrin clot. So, all these factors 9A, 11A or 8A is responsible for conversion of factor 9A into with the help of factor 5A into thrombin and fibrin clot following any wound or injury. Now, let us discuss about fibrinolytic system. Like you have seen that there is a fibrin clot is formed. Now, how you dissolve the fibrin by fibrinolytic system? Now, as you see that there is a you know stimuli blood pro activators which following a various stimuli that there could be injury or there could be other comorbid conditions which blood get activated and ultimately you have already discussed a drug like tissue plasmogen activator or urokinase. So, these are the drug has been given to dissolve the clot. Now, if you see the main pathway the plasminogen it is converted to plasmin and this plasmin actually help in fibrinogen degradation product to fibrinogen and thrombin. So, ultimately you can see that fibrin degradation products like all these are anti activator can be given in order to prevent plasminogen which is converted to plasmin ultimately it from the fibrin. So, there is a activation pathway activation pathway and you can see that what are the inhibitory pathway like you can give anti activator or amino caprique acid. And you have seen that there are drug which is a newer drug like tissue plasminogen activator. Some are very fast acting we have to give it immediately or drug like urokinase. You can see that it dissolve and this is a anti 
triplets like some of the drug you can see that that it dissolve the clot. Now, in order to classify this anticoagulant, you can say that anticoagulant the group of drug. Now, in case of in vivo like we use parenterally, we give IV or other parenteral route or drugs are used in orally also. Now, what happened in in vitro condition like we take a blood sample collection, we put an anticoagulant and we send it for blood by MST or some of the investigation. Now, invariably you use in in vitro condition like we use heparin and heparin it is used 150 unit in 100 ml of blood. Second thing is we also use calcium chelation complexing agent in in vitro condition. Like you have seen that we send the investigation of the blood sugars, lipid profile or any of this liver function test or kidney function test. So, whenever you collect we use anticoagulant, but if you want to collect the serum you do not need anticoagulant. It get clot you want to estimate in serum, but if you estimate in plasma definitely in in vitro situation you need a anticoagulant. Now, anticoagulant which is used in in vivo and in case of emergency or where you have to use parenteral. So, basically you have seen that in case of emergency parenteral these are indirect thrombin inhibitors. You can take an example of indirect thrombin inhibitors is earlier used to use heparin. Nowadays it is used low molecular weight heparin or you have a new drug like Pendoxu, Pendaperinox or Denaperinoid. Like indirect acting thrombin inhibitors, we have also direct thrombin inhibitors. Direct inhibitor, you can take example of Lepirudin or Bilvalirudin. So, we have a parenteral indirectly thrombin inhibitors like heparin and low molecular weight. We have a direct thrombin inhibitors which are a newer drug. At the same time, we also use various drugs orally. For example, we use orally curcumin derivatives like dicumoral. Warfarin is very, very commonly used. Acetamocomolar or indolent derivative like phene, dion, or we have also drug acting which inhibit factor 10A inhibitors like rivaroxaban. So, most commonly orally if you see that invariably we use that warfarin. Of course, we have different group of drug or 10A inhibitor is also present here in in vivo situation orally. Now, in case of in vitro like we take an example of heparin we use 150 unit per 100 ml of blood or we use a calcium you know complexing agent like sodium citrate which is used 1.65 gram for 350 ml of citrate dextrose solution or 75 ml in one in of blood. So, whenever you donate the blood, if you see the bag, it is CPDA, earlier it was CPDA or CPD, citrate phosphate dextrose. So, citrate is a anticoagulant phosphate and dextrose is a nutrient. So, that is required when you collect 300 ml of blood, it is almost 49 ml is anticoagulant CPD. So, for any investigation like when you send up uh, uh, blood for any investigation like we have a sodium oxalate and this sodium oxalate is used 10 milligram per ml of blood or you have a EDTA vial sodium EDTA which is used for 2 milligram for 1 ml of blood. So, these are used when you collect the blood for blood donation or when you collect the blood for any of the investigation in in vitro situation. Now, coming back to heparin, heparin as prototype. As you know that it is an endogenous substances and strongest you know you can think that when you look at strongest organic acid present in the body. Now, what are the area the heparin is present? The area of heparin that one is mast cell, mast cell of molecular weight more than 70,000 and that is mostly present in organ like lungs or livers or intestinal mucosa. As you see that any allergic mediated muscle get regranulated, all these are released. 
So, commercially heparin is prepared from ox lung or it is also prepared from pig mucosa. So, you can see that in slaughterhouse where the pig mucosa or the ox lung it has been taken for commercially making it for heparin. So, if you look at chemically it is a non uniform mixture of straight sin and which contain mucopolysaccharide and this molecular weight is around 10,000 to 20,000. As you see molecular weight is very high. So, when you any drug molecular weight is very high it is safe for pregnancy it does not cause placental barrier. So, this heparin is safe in pregnancy. So, it also causes electronegative charges. So, type of heparin if you see that regular unfractionated heparin which molecular weight is 5000 to 30000 and it is given intravenously or it can be given subcutaneously. Then there is another form which is used most of the time is low molecular weight heparin and this molecular weight is 2000 to 6000 and it is given subcutaneously. Now, the how heparin act? It has mechanism that it is indirectly acting. That means, it activate plasma antithrombin 3. Second thing is heparin act on plasma antithrombin 3, it inactivate the clotting factors involved intrinsic pathway that we discuss. So, at low concentration when 10 A mediated conversion from prothrombin to thrombin it is effective when you give heparin and overall if you see that 10 A mediated conversion from fibrinogen to fibrin. So, there is no clot formation occurs. Now, when you look at that heparin act on antithrombin 3 basically it is a suicide inhibitor. So, what it does it bind the clotting factor slowly to form the stable complex. So, heparin it is enhanced by one is heparin it create the scaffolding to binding the clotting factors with each other with antithrombin 3. Second thing is that this is a specific polysaccharide heparin it bind to antithrombin 3 and it change conformational and changes with the bind factors and that is how it act as anticoagulant. Now, this action of 10 A which is you can see that some of the example of low molecular heparin like Fondo Peru Nux and it need to be have the mechanism like it has an antiplatelet action. That means, if you give high dose it causes prevention of platelet aggregation with prolonged bleeding tendency. So, kinetically if you see pharmacokinetically it is basically is highly ionized. So, it is not absorbed orally. So, you have seen that it is only given IV or low molecular weight heparin it is given subcutaneously. So, when it is given IV it has instinct action immediately it act or if you want to make sure that slowly it should act you give subcutaneously. And since molecular weight is high it does not cross blood brain barrier or it does not cross placental barrier. So, it is same in pregnancy. So, you give the dose of 100 unit per kg and it has a half life of 1 hour and this dose like 1 to 4 hours you have to repeat. But one has to be careful that it should not be given with drug like penicillin. Why penicillin? There is an allergic mediated action or you also avoid to give drug with hydrocortison or tetracycline. Now, let us discuss in detail about heparin and mechanism of action. We have in detail we have discussed that it act on antithrombin which is inactive. Now, if you look at this figure this antithrombin is active form with thrombin and other factors. So, that is how because another angle that it is also acting on factor 10 A. So, heparin and low molecular weight and that is how it act on antithrombin and factor 10 A. Now, one has to be look at what are the adverse effect it has. Adverse effect if you see that it should be appropriately used. 
you want a faster action, you give IV, you want a slow action, you give subcutaneously. So, whenever you give it to the patient, you should be continuously monitor the patient because you need to ask some you know leading question about overdose of this heparin and anticoagulant. The patient will tell you that if you ask that do you have any color change in the urine, like suppose there is a hemasuria, blood in the urine, it will talk about that there is a change of urine color, red colors. So, you can understand that there may be bleeding in the urine or you ask a leading question in case of a thrombocytopenia, any bleeding tendency, bleeding from the nose, ear or change of the colors or maybe in a tears or even a you know sweat also. But one has to be taking detailed history about hypersensitivity because articaria, rigors or patient complaint of the fever and one has to be careful about anaphylaxis. Those who are allergic to this compound, then they might develop anaphylaxis. So, one has to be, but in case of you know that some of the factors like you give heparin, people have a loss of hairs called alopecia, but in a higher dose for continuously use, patient also has osteoporosis, particularly in female patients where, there, so in case of any susceptibility of osteoporosis, it should be avoided. Now, this heparin is also contraindicated in case of a bleeding disorders. In case of a patient with severe hypertension where there is a bleeding tendency or peptic ulcer, JT ulcers or in case of a hemorrhoid or portal hypertension. Okay. So, this in case of a malignancy or any ocular neurosurgery or chronic alcoholism or cirrhosis, because in a cirrhosis you have you know that those who are a chronic patient of cirrhosis they have all this portal like lower part of the esophagus or in a rectum there is a bleeding tendency because of hemorrhoid. So, it should be avoided because there could be continuously bleeding and it could be risk to the life also. Now, when that patient is taking a concomitant medication like aspirin or any of this antiplatelet, one has to be very, very cautious of giving anticoagulant. Now, coming back to most of the important drug is low molecular weight heparin. As I said that low molecular weight, so molecular weight is 2000 to 6000. Now, how it act? It act by interfering 10A and on action of 10A, it induce the conformational changes of antithrombin 3 and which is have a smaller effect of plus uh, partial thromboplastin, uh, you know, PTT and it affect the whole clotting time. Now, this also have a lesser action on antiplatelet, it has a antiplatelet. So, it lower incidence of hemorrhagic complication compared to the heparin or it has a better bioavailability. So, it is given subcutaneously or once daily. So, half life you see it is 4 to 6 hours and there is a monitoring is required, lab monitoring. So, you look for all this clotting time affected little. So, basically low molecular weight heparin, it is used in case of a prophylaxis patient with deep venous thrombosis or patient with pulmonary embolism or in case of unstable angina or myocardial infarction and also other condition like hemodialysis patient, it has been used. Now, the doses when you look at the heparin, it is expressed in a unit and it is standardized by the biase or variable molecular size. Now, if you see that comparison that 1 milligram, 1 milligram of heparin, it has an activity of 120 to 140 unit activity. So, it is given IB 5000 to 10,000 unit followed by 1000 unit in an hour in IB drip and you also look for PTT, activated PTT value, then you adjust the dose. Or alternatively, what you can do is 10,000 to 20,000 subcutaneously, 8 hourly with a fine needle. And when you select low dose, 5,000 subcutaneously, it is given 8 to 12 hours before and after surgery to prevent deep venous thrombosis. Of course, in case of overdose, we have a drug called protamyl sulfate. 
and this protamine sulphate is a heparin antagonist. Protamine sulphate is a heparin antagonist and it is given IB 1 milligram that is equivalent to 100 unit and this is be preferred you have to keep it ready if you are going for any cardiac or vascular surgery. Now look at the oral anticoagulant, we discuss about parenteral. Basically oral anticoagulant, how it is acting? It is decarbolated coagulation, coagulation factors like 2, 7, 9 and 11. And this is coagulation factor 2, 7, 9, 10 and ultimately you see that effect of vitamin K, it block by giving the oral coagulant. So, it act on vitamin K epoxide reduction that is how it act as a oral anticoagulant. And one of the very common used drug in oral anticoagulant is in vivo not in in vitro that is warfarin. And this warfarin it basically a competitive antagonist of vitamin K and it lower the plasma level of vitamin K dependent coagulation factor because all this we have discussed that coagulation factors dependent on vitamin K it reduce. So, it inhibit epoxide reduxes that is needed to generate the vitamin K. So, basically if you see the synthesis of clotting factors it diminishes within few hours at different time by different factors. But the anticoagulation action it will start only 1 to 3 days only. So, if you give this drug, this effect is remain for 1 to 3 days. So, warfarin it accumulate because it is metabolized by cytochrome 2 C9 and it yet mediate oxidative metabolism. So, commercially if you see that we have warfarin RNS enantiomer. So, look at the ADR profile adverse drug reaction or untoward effect. It has similar like bleeding tendency. People might say after giving warfarin, you look at that is there any nasal bleeding like epistaxis or you ask is there any change of urine color or hemasuria or stool color like in case of GI bleeding or one has to be careful about intracranial hemorrhages. And this drug warfarin is indicated because of atrial fibrillation where the heart is beating so fast there is chances of coagulation in case of atrial fibrillation or in a patient where you give a prosthetic heart valve. So, you put anticoagulation as a prophylactic one or venous thromboembolic phenomena like primary or pulmonary hypertension or in case of a rarely acute after acute MI myocardial infarction. But one has to remember that contraindication are similar what we discussed with heparin, bleeding tendency severe hypertension, peptic ulcer. So, one has to remember that these are some of the contraindication one cannot use oral anticoagulant like warfarin. Now, in case of a fetal hydrogen syndrome or skeletal abnormalities or hypoplasia to nose or eye socket or hand bones, so these are adverse epicardium. Kinetically, if you see that this once it given orally, it is completely absorbed in the intestine and this absorption is almost 99 percent. And this drug is bound to plasma protein. So, almost 99 percent is plasma protein binding. So, 1 percent is free. So, many of the drugs it displays like you can say that there are a lot of interaction with warfarin. Common interaction you can name sulfonamide or some of the narrow therapeutic drug like phenytoin one has to be very careful because there is a drug drug interaction. So, toxicity might happen in case of a narrow therapeutic in this drug and this has a longer half life, it is almost 36 hours. So, this drug is risky or you calculate the risk or benefit in a dose when you select of repeated measurement of coagulation time. So, optimum ratio of protombin time if you see that 2 to 2.5 or in case of a deep venous thrombosis you go for 2 to 3 in deep venous thrombosis or in case of a MI 3 to 3.5 in myocardial infarction. As you see that it is mostly interact with various drugs, but there are some comorbid condition also. It is very highly protein binding 99 percent. 
Now, what happened in case of malnutrition? Now, what happened in case of a liver disease where albumin and globulin ratio is low? What happened in case of a newborn or chronic alcoholism or in case of a protein like prolonged antibiotic treatment also have interaction. So, one has to be careful in case of a pregnancy or in case of nephrotic syndrome or in case of you know genetic warfare in resistant cases. So, in case of a already resistant cases it will not have it will have a refractory action. One way it has lot of interaction or one has to be careful in case of a comorbid condition like malnutrition which is very very prevalent in India or liver disease or chronic alcoholism which can give us chronic liver disease or in case of prolonged antibiotic use. Now, if you look at in detail of interaction you can see that broad spectrum antibiotic or when you use concomitantly with drug like aspirin or any cephalosporin, newer cephalosporin, coramphenicol, allopurinol, tolbutamide, phenytoin, nadotherapeutic index drug. So, this has lot of interaction and other drug like barbiturate, carbamazepine and oral contraceptive pill or rifampicin one has to be careful about interaction. So, there is a provision when you start with warfarin monitoring that you need to monitor the drug or you need to monitor the profile of the patient because it is considered because there is a risk of bleeding. So, it is considered narrow therapeutic induced drug with warfarin. So, standard procedure it is maintained that you look for prothrombin time and at the regular interval you go for INR. So, you have to look for INR before you adjust any of the dose. So, this INR is daily until therapeutic range for 2 weeks time. So, every 2 week uh, 3 times in a weekly 2 weeks you have to do that whether it is stable or patient is responding to the warfarin dose whatever it is given with a particular appropriate dose you that it is responding or not. So, INR it is done every 3 to 4 weeks frequently induction of new medication. So, the monitoring is utmost required when you start with warfarin because of as you see that detail of drug interaction or underlying some of the comorbid condition that it can alter and there is a risk of bleeding. Now, warfarin in venous thromboembolism, warfarin should not be initiated concurrently with parenteral heparin. Second thing is in case of a venous thromboembolism, usual your target is INR you have to keep it around 2 to 3. So, once you start the treatment after 5 days, you need to know that warfarin should be continue or you have to decide that it continue for 3 months or you see that optimal duration of anticoagulation depend on you look for all clinical monitoring and blood biochemistry. Other than warfarin, we have newer anticoagulant agent like for example, oral 10A inhibitors. So, we have number of drug of 10A inhibitors like rivaroxaban, epixaban, endoxaban. Now, what it does? These are given at fixed dose and that is why it is do not require monitoring like warfarin. And you can see that warfarin has a very long half life 36 hours, but this drug has a shorter half life and it is rapidly act there it is action last for almost more than beyond 3 days. And this is has a substrate to cytochrome 3 a 4 enzyme or P glycopene transporter. Basically, all these drugs are direct thrombin inhibitors like hirudine, bilvaridine. It bind to both catalytic as well as thrombin active site. Drug like agabetron or melagatrerone, you can see that it bind to thrombin active site. So, another example of the drug of lipuridine actions basically it has an independent anti thrombin and this is also been approved by FDA for in case of a you know heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So, this drug has been approved in case of a heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Now, look at the directly acting oral anticoagulant. We have discussed about warfarin, 
another directly acting anticoagulants are dagi another directly acting warfarin are dabigatron which is also approved by us fda so basically advantage if you see with compared to conventional one is there is no monitoring is required and when you look at the drug drug or other comorbid condition there is a fewer drug interaction or it is also fewer dietary interaction with this drug so we have anticoagulant parenteral we have a oral anticoagulant but one has to be remember that all this anticoagulant therapy there is lot of monitoring is required specially oral anticoagulant or when you give a emergency purpose of any anticoagulant you have to be very very careful of in case of you have to also remember that what are the condition it is contraindicated because sometimes you want a very fast action like you give a intravenously or you want a slower action and orally particularly warfarin like drug where you need to go for a monitoring you go for a regular inr and we have a directly anticoagulant drug which is less monitoring is required less drug interaction or less dietary interaction but depending on a condition that you have to also look at the affordability and the cost factor is involved of course drug like heparin it is very safe in pregnancy because of high molecular weight or it does not cross the blood brain barrier so you have to decide so you have any questions or any discussion kindly do that thank you very much